Good morning and welcome. Uh, I would like to greet you all here in the Burg Theater. My name is Misha Glenny. I am the new rector of the Institut für die Wissenschaften von Menschen. And I'm speaking in English because today's debate is going to be uh, in English. Thank you all for coming along on this Sunday morning to the Burg Theater. Um, it is, of course, uh, 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 Mother's Day here in, in Austria, and so uh, you're especially welcome, particularly if you're a mother. Um, and, uh, but today is the latest in a, a series of events of long-standing cooperation between the IWM, the IWM, uh, the Erste Stiftung, the Erste Foundation, that is uh, Der Standard, and of course, the Burgtheater. Um, and although today is uh, Mother's Day here in Austria, it's also a day of reflection, May the 8th. Because May, on May the 8th, 1945, uh, Nazi Germany surrendered to the Allies. And here we are, all those decades later, and once again we have war in Europe. And so this is a particularly difficult moment for all of us. And we want to try and understand in today's panel whether Europe can create peace. This is now one of the most pressing questions, not just for Europe, but actually for the whole world because the impact of what's going on in Ukraine um, is so severe across the globe. So, let me now, without further ado, welcome our chair for today, Eric Frey from The Standard. Of course, one of our partners, he's a senior editor there, and he is going to introduce today's panelists. Please enjoy the discussion. I think it's going to be extremely illuminating. Thank you very much indeed. Eric. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for being here this morning on Mother's Day, on a day when you could do many other things, uh, including running on the Ringstraße <laughs> for a good purpose, but you joined us here at the, at the Book Theater uh, for a debate about uh, an, uh, one of those pressing issues uh, that, is, that is all face, has been facing us now for so many days. Today is the 74th day of the Russian aggression against Ukraine. 74 days full of atrocities, uh, full of horrors uh, for the Ukrainians who are terribly affected by what is happening in the country. But it has also been uh, uh, upended and changed so, so much for everyone in Europe. So much of the certainties of European life of the last uh, 70 years have suddenly been called into question. The belief that this is a continent now, after the horrors of World War I and World War II, a continent of peace, uh, that the European Union can create not only stability and bring peace within its own, uh, among its own members, but also uh, by being attractive to the countries outside, also uh, create a, a whole uh, region of stability on this, on, 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 on this continent and beyond. Um, we know now this, is, uh, this, is, this is, may not work if you have an uh, aggressive power on the outside that is using, willing to use not only military force, but also actual terror against uh, civilians in order to, f to achieve its, uh, its uh, fanatical goals. Um, and the question is, what does this mean for the EU, for larger Europe, because Europe is not only the EU, for also the European model of 
international relations of, 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 of uh, countries and the relationship between countries. Um, we have an excellent panel here assembled, at least I think so. Um, I want to start to introduce it uh, here with a, few, with a few words, starting with uh, Claudia Gammon. Uh, she was born in Feldkirch in the very west of Austria, but has been a leading figure in the NEOS party since her student years in Vienna and is now the member of, a member of the European Parliament for the NEOS in Brussels and Strasbourg. Um, Caroline Vigura is a Polish sociologist, a journalist, an expert on the history of ideas, uh, a professor at Warsaw University, a member of the European Council on Foreign Relations, currently based in Berlin. Uh, Marsha Gessen, a Russian-American journalist, author, based in New York. Uh, Marsha has written for numerous, numerous US publications, including the New York Review of Books and The New Yorker, and is an outspoken voice against autocrats, whether it's Vladimir Putin or Donald Trump, which you can see in her, in her numerous books. And Philipp Thea, uh, Austrian-German historian at the University of Vienna, he's an expert on Central and East European history, uh, recipient of the prestigious Wittgenstein Award in 2019, founder of the Research Center for the History of Transformation. Um, yeah. And uh, so the question is, what, what has Europe done? What has the EU done so far in this terrible conflict? And where will Europe go from here? Um, Marsha, you're the one non-European on this panel. Uh, looking from the outside, looking from uh, how would you evaluate the response of the EU and of the main European countries to the Russian aggression against Ukraine? Yeah. Have they done enough? Um. Well, that's, you know, have they done enough is an easy question to answer because obviously the war is uh, still ongoing, so they have not done enough. Um, but, you know, not to be flippant about it, um, but, but you have to ask the question of what, um, what is the actual goal of doing something in response to Russian aggression. If, um, if the goal is to stop the war, I'm not sure that that's actually possible. Right? So there has to be some other way of evaluating what, um, what the West is doing. <clears throat> and, and, I think that, uh, and I think that way it, it can actually be more productive. Uh, I, I would suggest saying, is the West doing, uh, doing all that it can to not aid Russian aggression? And that goes directly to the question of sanctions which uh, certainly looking from the United States, a lot of what we call sanctions, uh, and today the Speaker of the Russian Parliament said that Russia is subject to more than 10,000 different sanctions. Um, but of course what he's talking about is largely a sort of spontaneous boycott that is affecting the lives of ordinary Russians in significant ways and is not affecting uh, the, whether the ability of the regime to wage this genocidal war. And what has perhaps the potential to affect um, the regime, or at least the potential to let uh, the West say that we're not doing anything to help Russia wage this war, is an oil and gas embargo. embargo. And not one that would happen in six to eight months, um, but one that would go into effect right now, immediately. Uh, and I know that uh, you know the, uh, it's 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 fascinating because I think that once you f put the question that way, um, it exposes a lot of our assumptions about about this war and about this continent. Because when I've said this in the past, people have immediately said, "But that's not possible, mm -hmm. right?" And that's not possible uh, betrays what we think of as allowable and possible elsewhere, it is somehow possible and believable that, um, that 60 people died this morning uh, when Russia targeted a school in Ukraine, and it is somehow not possible and not believable that um, Euro European countries would subject 
uh, their populations to a real hardship, right, that would result from an immediate oil and gas embargo. It is not impossible. It's very, very hard and very, very expensive. Um, uh, it is the United States which has been also calling for these tougher sanctions a lot and so for the US it's relatively simple because they are not as dependent on, 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 on their energy supply from, from Russia. Uh, do you think the United States would be uh, would take a different stance if they were in a different, in the Biden administration, <laughs> if they were in a different position? Uh, or quite is quite it just likely. Something? Um, although I think that th there is a different calculus uh, in the United States. I mean, I think that um, <clears throat> that pushing this hard for uh, an immediate, oil, uh, or you know, the, pushing this hard for an oil embargo is perceived by Russia as an act of war on the part of the United States. I think it is an extremely risky move for the, uh, for, for the US administration. I mean, Putin has made that perfectly clear uh, from, from day one of the extreme US sanctions. On, on, on February 25th or 26th, he said, this is, no wait, this was a Monday. So a few days later, he said that, uh, that US sanctions are an act of war. Um, and so I think in, uh, I wouldn't underestimate the difficulty of, of, of taking the stance for the, for the US. Um, Claudia, there is a uh, there is a widespread feeling uh, in the United States, uh, also in some European country, that all what the what the Europeans are doing is half-hearted. Is what is the these are the, the low-hanging fruits, uh, but not but not the tough moves uh, that would re really re that are really required given the atrocities happening in in, in Ukraine. Uh, is the EU disappointed? Point is, the, is it causing disappointment? Could they and are they are they staying behind what should and could be possible? I think this is a tough question to answer because you have to look at it from different perspectives. As a European politician, I have to say I was positively surprised by the resolve in the first, let's say, the first two weeks um, after the beginning of the war, because you have to look at. Um, the institutional architecture of the European Union, how we make decisions, and it is fundamentally flawed in many ways. We see this in, in big picture decisions, but also in the everyday policy making that it simply isn't up to par anymore. It's, it's fallen out of time a little bit on how we make decisions and that we're not really able to react as quickly as we should. I think we saw this in the pandemic, but also before maybe in the financial crisis even. And so I, I don't think it is the adequate reaction, but putting it into perspective, I thought it was actually quite surprising, the resolve that the European Union showed, and that there, especially in the first two days, I was, I was ready to hear some country is blocking something. And we didn't hear that. It was really, I think, a new thing for EU reaction to crisis. And the European Union does grow in crisis. I think it changes our perspective to things. It shows how quickly things could change if we were willing to go that way. But obviously, um, maybe not thinking, thinking about it with a cynical EU bubble perspective, the bar is really low. I guess, I think everybody would think, why aren't we doing everything that we can? Why aren't we putting everything on the table? And I really understand that. And the European Parliament has actually shown that there, there is a majority of politicians in Europe willing to go all the way, and the European Parliament has, has voted and, and agreed to, to support a full and immediate gas and oil embargo. And even though it might be more difficult for certain countries, it certainly seems to be impossible for Austria, for example, but even if it's impossible and, and it might be wrong from an economical perspective for Austria, it can still be the right decision for all of Europe which is something that we experience all the time. And as Austrians, we often say, why isn't this in this country doing everything it can for Europe, even though it might not be right from a national perspective? So in the European Parliament, did you vote for an uh, uh, immediate gas embargo? Yes, I did. Yes. Uh, what was the responses that you got in Austria uh, for this vote? Pretty wild. Um, <laughs> it was, it was um, coming from the industry entirely negative. Uh, which didn't surprise me, because it is a question, yes, it would be 
impossible even, really, really hard for Austrian people, for the Austrian industry. But it can still be morally right, and it can still be the right thing to do for Europe. And I do think that we miscalculate also the economical risk of, risk of a really long war. We don't put it into perspective. A really long war isn't just expensive because of rising inflation for everyday citizens because the gas prices are so high, but for the entire industry. Um, global supply chains that have been rattled after the pandemic are now completely in shambles. And the longer this war drags on, even if we're just looking at the economic perspective for Europe, it's a catastrophe. So we're not calculating this right. An embargo has huge costs, but so does a long war for Europe if we're only looking at it economically. And I think morally, the answer is absolutely clear. Mm -hmm. um, Philip, Claudia said there has not been, she has been surprised, there hasn't been any blocking in, within the EU. Uh, have, the, have the European countries really been as united as they are claiming? In this, in this, in the, in this conflict, uh, in, the, in, in the beginning, yes, and I was impressed as well. But then look what happened after the Hungarian elections, when Orbán, without needing to do that, on the very evening of his big victory, first of all criticized Ukraine, uh, Zelensky, and also announced that uh, he would pay um, oil and gas. By the way, they could be. Uh, treated separately because they're slightly different issues, also in terms of revenue for Russia. But anyway, when he declared um, he's going to pay that in ruble, which would set off um, the f sanctions in the financial sector and would give a big boost to Russia because this is not just symbolic, but it would establish the ruble, which it was not yet, as an international currency with which you pay um, energy. It used to be dollar, then, you know, sometimes euro. Um, but, but anyway, um, so without needing to do so, he broke out of the sanction front. And so I'm also agreeing with you that this is, might be a very long war. And I think we should be more attentive, maybe even less self-assured about the home front or the home fronts. Um, now, why am I talking about the home front? Uh, because this is a war not just on Ukraine, but it is a war on the European Union, um, of course, and against NATO as well. And, um, and I don't think there is a sufficient awareness of that yet. Uh, one can see it with different declarations of German intellectuals and, well, and so on, but also um, politicians, that there is a lack of, of awareness that this is also our war. Um, and, and that you need to uh, have uh, sufficient uh, political, intellectual, of course also economic resources uh, to, get, to get through it. Talking about the immediate resources, of course, well, the, the sanction is a big thing. What I'm also missing, but that is also true for environmental politics, is a, uh, is a you know, pragmatic policy also of small steps. I mean, why don't I read about a concrete plan to save energy, gas, already now? I mean, it's done because of the high prices at the gas station, so people hesitate to make the usual uh, Sunday excursion. Um, it's harder for commuters. But anyway, why is there no plan, you know, to reduce the energy? Why don't we install, even at my workplace at the university, why don't we install uh, technical, cheap technical applications to save um, energy for, you know, the little um, hot water heaters and so on. And that, that's what I'm also missing, you know, that we understand really, okay, we are threatened, this is a home front, this is our war, and let's take immediate steps already now and not just talk about the grand picture. Um, so you expect that it won't only be Hungary that is kind of the odd man out here in the, from the European front and that you will have bigger fissures, bigger tensions between different European countries in the coming months as the, as the war will drag on? Oh, that we don't know. Um, but here it was openly declared. Yeah. Um, and it had no impact on European policies or the decision of foreign investors in Hungary, German ones, uh, the biggest among them. Um, so I think there should be clear signals. Other countries, for a variety of reasons, are asking for exceptions. Slovakia, 
uh, Czech Republic, you know, to, to phase out the boycott on oil a little later. Um, but uh, they clearly support the sanctions, and they're just asking for a plan, you know, to implement step by step, which I think that is understandable. Um, so, so far, Hungary is isolated, but that could change, you know. Italian elections next year. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Whatever. I mean, there's always in democracies you have uh, inbuilt um, changes of, of policies, whereas Putin can expect to be there for many, many years. And that is also important to keep into account in the home front that we are democracies. We are more vulnerable, more changeable, and so we need to stabilize that now mm -hmm. as much as possible. Yeah. Caroline, up. Uh, Poland has been here on the front line, has been also in the forefront of, of, of demanding a, a tougher, tougher, tougher position, also based on historical uh, experience with Russia. Um, is Poland, is there a feeling of disappointment in Poland about the support, the backing that it gets from the rest of the European Union? You're right to say that Poland uh, has this particular uh, position right now because we started to feel on the 24th of February as, we, as if we started to live on the brink of a volcano, right? So this is not what we thought before. We thought for 30 years that we are actually safe, that we are actually safe. So, so, so yes, it's a, it's a very big change, but actually it comes... To, to the very core of our existence, to the very core of our historical experience. And this is not only Polish, but actually also, um, you, can, you can feel it in the Baltic states, you can feel it in the Ukraine, namely that we have a lot of existential fears, right? So we believe basically that it is unavoidable that this war will spill over the Ukrainian uh, border. And if it's not today, if it's not in a year, then it will be in 10 years. I don't say it's a fact, I just, say, this is the dominating emotion, this is the dominating mm -hmm. fear. And I do believe that, that there is something uh, particular about this collective fear. It is different than the fears in Western Europe. Because Western Europe basically is afraid, the, the citizens are afraid, the politicians are afraid, and rightly so, of course, that the world war is coming back, that it is going to spill over the continent. It's a different fear. It's a different fear. But I do believe those fear, fears can be articulated and there might be a consensus between these fears because, after all, the goal is the same, that the European Union survives and that the values are being protected also in the Ukraine. Yes, but those who, also intellectuals who say, I'm afraid of World War III, uh, a tend then to say, well, maybe we should not provoke Russia anymore and maybe take a somewhat softer position, while those who are afraid of Russian aggression saying we should not leave any kind of, show any sign of, of, of weakness. Isn't there kind of a split, um, let's say, between Poland and Germany? I mean, you are based in Berlin now, and I'm sure you have some interesting debates with, with German colleagues. Mm -hmm. And their perspective, how, how big is this fissure? There is not only a split, there is a development which is, uh, which is a little bit worrying. You started with Poland and its particular understanding of history, and I would say yes, and particular arrogance. Uh, arrogance of saying we know better because we have better experienced uh, the Russian imperialism. We have experienced it for the past four, 300 years, so we know better. But listen. Almost every European country says this right now. And I mean the, the, the governments, right? So you, can, you have the personification of this moral arrogance competition between Mr. Morawiecki on one side and Mr. Macron on the other side. So each of them tells the other one that he understands the situation better, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important to grasp that because you have this, you have the competition of moral arrogance or mor moral higher ground on the, on, the, on the government level. And on the other hand, you have the normal citizens who in Poland, in Germany, in France, in Austria, help the citizens of Ukraine fleeing. So I think it's very important that we grasp this difference, right? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, only if, if those very intimate, very private uh, uh, examples of help offering uh, apartments, offering food, offering clothes, 
even offering to go for a coffee with, with someone who lives alone in a, in a, in a strange, in a, in a new, uh, uh, unknown uh, city. Only if those intimate examples of help are a little bit listened on the government level can we find a compromise mm -hmm. between those fears and those arrogances that I mentioned. Marsha, when you, when, uh, before when I asked you about European response, you focused on economic sanctions. Um, but isn't the military support that Western countries are giving to Ukraine even more important? Isn't this what is going to be decisive for the outcome of this war? And, and isn't there kind of a growing feeling that it's the US that's doing all the hard labor and the Europeans, um, yes, being kind of just uh, being a bit of an in a supportive role? Uh, I, you know, I'm not a military expert. Yeah. I can't tell you what is going to be decisive. Mm -hmm. uh, I, <clears throat> I think that the, you know, I'm, not, I'm going to go back, uh, right back to what I was saying before, yeah. which is the terms in which we discuss this, I think, are morally, um, outrageous. And, um, and what I mean by that is that, you know, the, in the United States, certainly the, do the dominant conversation is what military aid can we give to Ukraine so as not to provoke Russia, Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? Russia is waging a genocidal war on Ukraine. <clears throat> and another way to to phrase what the, uh, what has become a commonplace of, 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 of political conversation is, it is uh, how do we maintain a situation in which it's only Ukrainians who are dying? Um, and that's, that's an untenable. So you're really saying the NATO had, needs to put actually uh, soldiers on the ground and be on the fight on the side of Ukrainians against, I'm not against saying Russia? That. I'm, saying, I'm saying that having a conversation that makes a, uh, a distinction in the value of human life of Ukrainians and, uh, and citizens of NATO countries is morally abhorrent. To, not to distinguish between one or the other. Uh, in the United States, if you take a little bit detour here, uh, there is also, there is a general, well, there is a broad consensus, but there are also strong forces in the, in the Republican Party, the Trumpian uh, wing of the Republican Party, where uh, Putin has more, more sympathy than one would, than, 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 than would expect or would, would want. Uh, can this also become a political factor in the, maybe after the midterm elections or after perhaps if the war goes on after the next presidential election that the US may not be as stalwart as we, as we, as we think? Um, and that's, uh, that actually adds to the urgency. If there isn't enough urgency uh, because, because people are dying right now, there should be more urgency because really the United States has five and a half months left to, to, to act fully. So, um, Bef 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 before the um, the makeup of, of Congress may change to the to such an extent that, administ that the administration is, um, is shackled. So, what would you expect now from the U.S. in the next five and a half months to do in order to to also fulfill what you what you basically your moral argument about what is right? Um, so, I mean, you you keep trying to get a journalist to. Uh, <laughs> to give a, a policy recommendation, and it's just not going to happen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you, it remains a commentary about, right. about, 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 about the position. Uh, uh, Claudia, I mean, as a, in the last, last 74 days, really the debate in the European Union has changed from we are, we are a force of peace in the world and we are trying to, uh, military spending is something which is not that, that important and the welfare of our citizens is more important and maybe to spread, uh, give development assistance and humanitarian assistance to the rest of the world. And suddenly, uh, every country is adding to its military budget. I mean, Germany, which, is, is, which has really neglected its military for a long time, is, 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 is doing a lot. Uh, is this like a fundamental shift in European security policy? 
going from this soft power model now to a much more maybe American style, hard power uh, role, or is it just a kind of a short term reaction to say, okay, now we have to do something and we're a little bit more afraid, so we'll spend a bit more on our, on our armies? Hmm. I hope it will be a fundamental change. Okay. I do hope that it doesn't end up t with 27 member states adding to their independent military budgets, but that we move into the way of actual European security architecture where we combine our forces and also combine our spending in a way that we, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous the way that, if you look at the, at the sheer numbers of what European countries, the sum of them spend on, on their military and comparing with what other larger nations get from, uh, this would get from the same amount of euros or dollars spent, it's ridiculous. I mean, we, we allow ourselves to have parallel systems with, with no overall coordination, um, which is, is, is excessive and it doesn't get us anywhere. However, I don't think that we have to compare ourselves or the goal to a, an, an American style of, of security policy because it's all right to find our own European style of, 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 of security policy, of military policy. I think it can be values-based, but it shouldn't be naive. We shouldn't base our entire security policy on the fact that we believe we'll be all right. That's not a way to protect your citizens. It's not a way to go about the world. And also, the European soft power has always been based on our single market. The power of the single market, the power of the European consumer, and the way that we use this in trade agreements to bring about change and progress in the world. That will only last for so long. What if our single market starts getting smaller and smaller in comparison to other large markets in the world? We're not building on anything. We're just, you know, we're just living off our past success as a European single market and as the European Union as a, as a global power. And we aren't reacting to the changing world that we live in. Um. You, you mentioned that there isn't enough coordination, cooperation on the military side in, 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 in Europe, but most countries, with very few exceptions, are members of NATO, and in, in the near future, probably, Austria may be the odd man out, and also, except Ireland, we're the only EU country that is not in NATO. Doesn't NATO uh, give this kind of framework where, you, where, where European countries can... can Co to cooperate in a way to make the military spending uh, effective? Um, well, I guess right now um, our security is dependent on NATO, the, the security of the entire European Union, also of Austria. I mean, the Austrian situation is something very special and, in, and increasingly ridiculous because we are free riding on the security guarantees of other countries and playing the old-fashioned to Austria Nube in a different way, like let, let the others play war and we believe we'll be fine making deals. And this has been an Austrian way. I think it has always been morally corrupt in a certain ex to, to a certain extent. But we now see that we have to bring something to the table for European defense. And while I, am, I, I very much disagree with the commonplace intellectual European anti-American stance when you look at NATO, there's a clear anti-American um, sentiment that comes along with everything where you say, but you know, what are the American interests actually? Do we really know they, they play their own game? Well, this may be true. The European security is entirely dependent on NATO and uh, the US right now. And while this comes from no place of anti-Americanism, I am a true transatlanticist, but the European Union needs to have a, a sovereign way, its own independent way of guaranteeing its security. It's just not, not out of an anti-American sentiment, but because it would be ridiculous otherwise. We are, we are capable of providing so much for ourselves, but not our own military security. That's, I, I, sometimes I can't fathom how we got into this situation and nobody along the way said, wait, how can this be? Well, Poland uh, is one of those countries that basically says, well, the only, only ally we can truly rely on is the United States. Uh, I think the pro-American feeling is particularly strong in, in, in Poland, if I, if I read this right. Um, 
do you see any chance to that Poland would could also feel secure in a in a more European security structure, where the U.S. is at least maybe taking a little bit of a step back and say, okay, let Europe do the the moves that are necessary. The U.S. is is shown as the the most reliable ally, but let's say it's but done by a populist government. And we have never uh, done it before. The U.S. was never seen as the only ally, the, the only reliable ally before 2015. So, so it, it does not work like this. I do believe that it comes from from the fact that um, that the, the the law and justice government simply doesn't have the the, the idea how to effectively uh, do politics, the international politics within Europe. Right? Who are the allies? The, the, the ally, uh, which was very natural to Poland, the, the, our most important ally in, within the United Europe, was Germany for many years. Now it's not, because it's ideologically wrong. Uh, the, 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 the United Kingdom that was, uh, that was uh, then chosen by, by the government, uh, well, is not obviously because of the Brexit uh, anymore. So, so they're a little lost and isolated. So I wouldn't say they, 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 they actually think that, that, that um, the US is this great ally. I think that they have isolated themselves to the extent that they have to, to, to understand uh, the US like this. But I, I would like to, to, to go back uh, mm -hmm. once again to, to, to our question about um, how do we secure peace, yeah. right, in, in Europe. In my head, there are two uh, pictures of, of peace that are, that are to somehow contradicting each other. They both come from philosophy. The first one is a philosophical de depiction of, of how we achieve stability by Thomas Hobbes. Basically, Thomas Hobbes, the 17th century philosopher, he believed that our human nature is not very bad, but we are very weak, very passionate, and we have very short memory. So we have to stabilize ourselves. Uh, if we don't do it, we'll kill, kill each other mm -hmm. sooner or later. So basically, I think the Hobbesian les lesson is the most important lesson uh, that we uh, gained in, in, during the Second World War. So we understood that either we stabilize the continent or we will kill each other sooner or later. And now is the question, how is it possible that after a few decades of, of living in peace in Europe, we suddenly started to believe that it's not the Hobbesian word, so it's not that what we, what we learned, that it's the Kantian word. Mm -hmm. The Kantian word of perpetual peace where there are only democracies and they do not fight with each other. So one question is, of course, how do we behave in this situation? But the another is, question is, when we have peace, when we have it, how do we secure it? Right? How do we derive energy to, to secure peace, even if it is there, if we are used to it? I think that there is this contradiction, that, that the Europeans simply forgot to some extent that whatever they achieved that was good, it comes from the fear of coming back of the World War. Well, one of the, when you look at Kant's model of perpetual peace, I mean, one of them is also the rule of law, one of the pillars there. And this has been something where Poland has Good that you are asking this question to a Polish person. <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, well, who else would Obviously. ask it? <laughs> Um, has been kind of drifting, drifting away, and really until the, the recent developments, mm -hmm. Poland was really on the, on the, on the was, 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 was mostly criticized and seen as a threat to the European model. Um, are Poles aware of this? That Obviously, they are made under? my French colleagues uh, ask me, so if you know so well how to deal with Russia, how didn't you speak about it all the time during the past seven years, and instead of that you were attacking the European mm -hmm. order? So of course, of course you're right. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, uh, but the Poles are surprising not only for this reason, you know. Uh, I don't know whether you are aware of the new opinion poll uh, in Poland. They asked uh, the respondents whether you would fight or flee in the case of war. Yeah. So how many percent actually answered that they are going to flee? 80. 80 percent. I think it's, it's very telling. Oh, really? It's very telling. I think this society has simply believed so much that they entered the, we entered the European Union, we entered NATO, and it really ends 
with perpetual peace, but it's not like this. So we have to keep it in mind when you think about a united solution to the current war. Uh, Philip, is the, I mean, the, this model of perpetual peace, in a way, this is at the core of, of what the European Union was trying at least to create in its own realm. Uh, is this something which has to be called into question? No, I think it's still uh, internally that is uh, widely uh, guaranteed, but, uh, but of course externally. Mm -hmm. It is under pressure with all um, possible effects, as I said, on the home front and on social peace. And so I'm not so sure, you know, if the war drags on, how that is going to uh, play out in, the, in two or three years. But I want to come back to, to Carolina's comment about the Poles also being already post-heroic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is interesting. I was asked um, by um, a Czech friend, well, what would happen if, you know, uh, the Russian army would attack Austria or Germany? And, and the answer was very clear, capitulation. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think we would simply give up and capitulate. At least that was my answer um, six, seven weeks ago. So I think they would not fight. And this is, um, uh, most of the people would not fight. Mm -hmm. um, and this post-terrorism, of course, was something nice and I liked it myself, but um, now the times have changed. And, and again, this is why I think we also need to get an awareness that not just the war on us, but also the, the post-heroic phase is kind of over, unfortunately. I think this is also so important to understand, to get an idea why and what the Ukrainians are doing. Mm -hmm. um, they're really fighting. Of course, it is so the moral dilemma uh, you have mentioned, right? The Ukrainians are dying and we are saving our lives. Uh, this is untenable. But even, you know, the, the, on the intellectual level, um, we are basically watching the war from a balcony. Now we're sitting on the balcony of the balcony here. Um, and I think this is a huge, uh, a huge dilemma. Now, your question was about Europe and what can and should it do. Okay, at the moment, actually, the U.S. is putting up most of the military support yep. for maybe half a year, but then in the two and a half years, if they might select an isolationist president, be Trump or, or somebody else, um, then what? Um, then, indeed, this might trigger something, you know, attack on other countries, the breakdown of the home front, uh, retreat from, from Ukraine, all sorts of, um, of effects. And therefore, I mean, I'm, I'm a historian, I'm even less inclined to give uh, policy advice, but I should, uh, I'm you know, trained to read the past. Um, but anyway, um, obviously, Europe must secure its own security, otherwise it will be gone. And the, looking at the home front, and not always staring at Russia, then the time is very limited to do that. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, this European security must be done against NATO in competition with NATO. I think it can be in accordance. That is possible. But um, definitely, it's uh, time to think about that now. Mm -hmm. um, because otherwise, you know, all these wars have taken on many, many years. And, and so I think that should be debated. What we should debate less, I think, in public is weapons delivery. I mean, I cannot understand why that is always discussed in public. I can understand it because we are democracies, but if you look at the Yugoslav war, how was uh, uh, the Serb military advance stopped? By secret, <laughs> mostly secret weapons delivery to the Croatian <laughs> army, and then eventually also something getting to the Bosnian army. Um, and that, um, by the way, um, eventually ended the war. Unfortunately, in an in a, um, awkward and in many ways bad compromise. But now, you know, we're always staring about, might Russia start the Third World War with nuclear attacks? And yet, paradoxically, we are debating every single tank and um, artillery which we are going to deliver on this way, replacing the Slovenian, which then goes to, um, to, to, to Russia, um, that is not a very smart decision, I think, to, to handle it yeah. in this way. What we should debate is indeed security at the home front. Mm -hmm. 
Marsha, I'm sure you have a few responses here to what has been said, but first the question. When you hear that even Poles uh, say they're not willing to fight, and we know Austrians would probably... Uh, it's surprising to me to hear that, but uh, and 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 Austrians, you can imagine what the, what the responses would be. How can you explain the Ukrainian uh, willingness to really fight and die for their country and this kind of also heroism that we see uh, see in the situation? What m makes them perhaps different? Um, I think that Ukrainians have in the last. Um, decade and a half had the experience of social cohesion that is probably unlike anything that other nations have have experienced in you know in in in, in our lifetimes right uh, or certainly in the last in the last generation the um, the Orange Revolution in 2004 but in particular the Revolution of Dignity. Um, in 2013-2014, which, which was an act of, of heroism and became a heroic story, a story of, of people standing up to violence by, by, coming, by, by literally coming out into the square in ever greater numbers until they defeated the violence. Right? Um, I mean, this... Um, <clears throat> I'm assuming people people know the the general trajectory of of, of the revolution of dignity, but it began with basically student protests that, uh, when um, w when the government cracked down brutally on the students. Older generations came out to to defend them. Basically, mm -hmm. unarmed people came out to defend them, and then stayed in the square for three months, in through the cold, through and and then ultimately facing down gunfire. Um, and, and, and until until they succeeded, I think that that um, that is first of all a hard won victory that people don't just turn away from, but I think it also tells us a national story about how this society functions. Right? It it functions by responding to violence with with valor and um, and uh, and mutual aid. And that's exactly how, you know, the, the, the story that we've, been, we've, we've seen being played out over and over. Why is Russia so different? Why is Russia so different? Well, um, <laughs> let me... Uh, <laughs> I, I have I, a Russian I, expert here on the panel. <laughs> see, you know, you know as ask. soon as you ask me about something that I know more deeply, you know, I'll tell you, uh, you, you know, I've written several hundred pages just <laughs> on that question. But... Um, but um, but I think that, let me, let, let, let me, let me rephrase this a little bit. Um, I think that's actually a large part of the reason for this war, right? Mm -hmm. Where actually um, Russia is fighting the anti-Russia. Uh, and this is how Russia has viewed Ukraine over, the, certainly over the last uh, 20 years, as, as a kind of alternative story of what could have happened in Russia. It, it's, it's, it's fascinating because I think in this way the regime and, and people who oppose the regime are equally short-sighted and imperialist in the way they look at the former colony because they both see just the other way of, of, um, of, uh, of, of seeing the story continue, right? The, these two countries that had the same um, experience, the same catastrophes in the 20th century, Ukraine to an even greater degree than Russia. Ukraine lost, lost more people to Stalinist terror. Ukraine, Ukraine lost more people in World War II. And, um, and then Ukraine basically goes and says, history is not destiny. You can, um, you can have a post-totalitarian society that, that organizes itself differently. Mm -hmm. And the, Rus uh, the Russian opposition says, this is wonderful, history is not destiny, we want to be just like Ukraine. And, um, and Putin says, you s what, do you, what do you mean history is not destiny? History is, is, is to destiny, and, um, and I, as a totalitarian leader, see it as my job to enforce the laws of history, so he goes and, and, and wages war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. That does not answer your question, but that's... No, it's... <laughs> it's <laughs> it certainly gives an answer. Um, I want to go back to this question of like, still this European model and the European 
model of the last 30 years has been how can we create peace? Well, we, we create a, a, a sphere of prosperity and stability and, and democracy and make this so attractive for countries which could go either way that they turn in this direction. I mean, this was a feeling that this has also worked in, the, in, in, in East Central Europe where some tendencies after the fall of communism could have gone in other direction. Uh, there's now the hope it will, it will work on the Balkans and perhaps even, e even beyond. Uh, is this model, does it still have a future? Can Europe continue? Will it work in the future? To just say, well, look how, how, how good life is when you are in the EU and when you follow our, our, our rules and our, our, our principles. Uh, go and do the right things and then join us. And then the moment we join the European Union, we become post-heroic. Yes, or uh, <laughs> post-liberal right. maybe too. I mean, not only post-heroic, but post... But not uh, every nation, right? I understand that the, that the Polish example and the Hungarian example are looming large. Yes. I understand this, but, but take the Baltic states, take yes. Estonia, they are not behaving like this. Yeah. And, and you, you might have hope, and I do have hope as a Polish citizen, that this is a phase, mm -hmm. that this is a phase, and that the struggle is going on, and especially in my country, which is very divided, the struggle is going on. It's not that uh, this is forever. I understand that in the uh, age of social media, we think that what is happening today will happen always, but it's not like this. And uh, I would like to, to continue a little bit on what Philip said and then what Masha okay. said, mainly, so, so, so the, the question of post-heroicism and the question of Ukrainians, like what can we learn from the Ukrainians? What can we learn from this courage? I, 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 I hear that you say values, cohesion, and I completely agree, and I would like just to add one more aspect which I wouldn't neglect in the age of social media again, and this is entertainment. You know, in 2015, in 2016, with the new wave of populism, with Kaczynskis and Trumps of this world, we basically started to believe that democracy, especially liberal democracy, is extremely boring. And that the only ones that are entertaining, that are keeping our attention, that are actually outrageous, but still they win our attention, are the populists. Mm -hmm. Look at Zawinski. Look how entertaining he is in his tra tragic position, right? This is a person who has created a whole new uh, image of what a democratic, heroic leader can do, right? So this is a guy who has been dancing in leather and on heels a couple of years ago. In my country, such videos were viral at the very beginning of the war, but surprisingly, it didn't take at all his legitimacy. It added up to his legitimacy because he's so authentic. And I do believe that we can learn from Zawinski. If we learn from Zawinski, if we learn not only this heroism, I do believe we should, but also that the media are just a tool that, that liberal democrats also can use them, then perhaps we can also have this future for Europe because Europe is a liberal democratic idea. Well, I can't think of another political figure in Europe who is more of an opposite to Zelensky, which is your vice prime minister, Kaczynski. Mm. Uh, this is he entertaining? Is, uh. No, I would <laughs> say no, and he's not. Uh, would, does, but does this, what you described, does this leave an impact also in Polish public opinion? Do people feel, wow, maybe, maybe we don't, we should follow different type of, 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 of leaders? You know, it's a beautiful question because, uh, as you know, Poland has received all, all, almost three million Ukrainians. And I must say, I'm usually quite critical about my own community, but this time I must admit I am very proud of what people are doing, of, of all those citizens who are offering their private homes to, 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 those, to, those, to those refugees. And we have a particular name for what is happening, what has been happening since uh, February. It's called the Carnival of Solidarity. Now, those of you who know history of Poland, the recent history of Poland, know that Carnival of Solidarity is a name that we used to call the Solidarność Revolution in 1980. This is exactly what we called it. And there is something to it mm -hmm. because suddenly, 
people of various views, the conservatives, the liberals, the centrists, the leftists, they suddenly saw each other. Like, okay, we have a common goal, we will help those people. And I don't say that it will happen overnight, but the solidarity really uh, empowers the political community. Here I am hopeful. Um, I would like to go back to my previous question about this European model and its attractiveness to also the, the non-EU members. Uh, Claudia, I mean, they, we do have the Balkan region, which is fell out of the headlines these days, but it remains volatile, even dangerous, and there are plenty of countries that would like to, like to join the EU. Some of them do have tendencies which remind you more of Russia than of, 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 of other countries. Um, I know I don't have to mention the word Serbia here. Um, do you think that the, do you think that the, but does, the, can, can, can Europe still project stability and its liberal values and, and uh, its uh, culture of compromise in this, re in this region? Is this still something you can be, we can be optimistic for? I don't know. Okay. I really don't know because I think the situation right now and the stronger influence that Russia and China also has in the region right now is a direct consequence of the European inaction. It's a direct consequence of us not being, um, not having enough courage to speed up the accession process of, of the Western Balkans into the EU, or to at least give them an honest perspective about how long this will take to at least give a feeling to a young generation, will I be the first generation of young people that will be EU citizens? They have none of that. They don't know where their, where their journey will be going, that they don't know when it will end or if it will end at all in EU membership. That is also clearly the fault of the French president and, and what he has done in the last two years in, in that regard. And the EU clearly doesn't have a strategy for enlargement right now, or, that, or we don't agree about what enlargement actually means. What we, how, how we don't have a clear view on what is the future of the European Union? How will it look like in 10 or 20 years? And I think this is also the reason why everybody is so completely overwhelmed uh, with the question on, on EU membership or at least candidate status for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Because even though I believe that our entire world has changed with this war, everything has changed. It's a complete shift in the view for the European Union. We still try and answer the question on, on, on um, candidate status for Ukraine with uh, as though the, law, the, the, the war didn't happen. We are answering it with the same, with the, with the natu natural laws of e EU policy making, at least in my opinion, have changed entirely, but we ignore it when it comes to the question of membership. Well, there has been a widespread feeling before the war broke out when it came to the re previous rounds of, 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 of EU enlargement that some of it was too fast that countries like Romania, particularly Bulgaria, maybe haven't, shouldn't have joined so quickly. Um, and then the question came up, well, what do you do with Poland and Hungary once they're in? Uh, they say, now we can forget about, we mm -hmm. can now uh, forget about uh, the, the following, f following Europe European rules. Are you suggesting this should be, this is, is, is no, longer, no longer that relevant? I simply suggest that we have to answer the question for ourselves, what is the European Union for? And okay. if it's still a peace project, if this is our raison d'etre, then we have to continue EU enlargement. Because just answer, try and answer the question, where would Romania and Bulgaria be right now if they weren't EU members? Where would Poland be? Where would Hungary be? I think we might be able to answer the question on where would Hungary be. Maybe it might be a part of Russia right now. We don't know, but it's not entirely impossible. And if we really believe that this, that our, our basic, our, the, the, the most basic goal of the European Union, why it exists to bring about peace and democracy, then we have to continue enlargement. Mm -hmm. This is not ex exactly an answer as to how fast should it go, but the goal has to be clear. It has to be clear to those that become candidates. Once you become a candidate, the goal is membership, and then the EU has to get you there. Mm -hmm. They have to make it possible for you that you can get there. Mm -hmm. um, Philip, is, is, is um, 
can the EU only basically project, achieve its goals in, in this in out in the in the, in the in the wider region if it really offers a very concrete perspective of membership? So does it have to constantly enlarge in order to uh, live in a in a somewhat peaceful and stable environment? Or are there other ways mm -hmm. to to achieve these to 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 to, yeah, to support you, you, these you seem to suggest alternative kinds of membership, and um, I'm not sure whether that should be the goal. But anyway, the way how one gets closer to the union, mm -hmm. uh, the accession, affiliation, that definitely needs to change. You know, why go on in the same way like it was before? Um, I think that is impossible. Then, in the end, of course, everybody knows that real full membership is a very long and protected uh, process anyhow, right? The acquis communautaire. Hmm? Uh, that How many takes, pages does it have? I um, think a couple. But, <laughs> but anyway, it? Yes. I think, of course, it must be redefined then, um, with also s agreeing upon certain uh, key ingredients, which would one be, of course, the separation of powers, right? Gewaltenteilung. Yeah. Uh, the an independent judiciary. I mean, it's absolutely crucial, and it needs to be <laughs> standardized, implemented, put through already now. Now, of course, it's difficult to roll back in a country like Hungary, where everything has been streamlined. <laughs> that, is a, that is a big task, but, but anyway, okay, learn from your mistakes, right? Uh, and do it different next time. The, uh, another key element, in my opinion, is the independence and pluralism of media. Um, you put up this question about Serbia. Okay, so let's speak about the elephant in the room. I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert on Serbia, but um, mm -hmm. similar to Hungary, I would say there's a, a massive problem with media pluralism. Um, in Hungary, I mean, the, the, uh, the, no oppositional paper can be printed in Hungary because any you know, company printing would be so afraid to be punished. So it can only happen in Slovakia. It has gotten that far. The Polish government, of course, doesn't uh, as trying to impinge the distribution of oppositional, mm, let's call them just uh, maybe um, pluralist um, newspapers in the in the store in the chain of stores, you know, in the kiosk and, the, and and so on and and. The, Highway, Kierski, there's a central distribution system. And there was all this pressure not to distribute Gazeta Vibarcha Politica and so on. Um, so, um, okay, again, an obvious problem. So, media pluralism then have a cartel law, right? That there cannot be media cartels like you have it in Hungary, which was openly formed, no action whatsoever. So, define certain key elements of what is a democracy. Um, and then, and, and then go for it. Of course, by the way, talking about these elements, then Ukraine is anyhow, um, in many ways, uh, closer to the European Union and some of its member states at the moment. By the way, the same is true for, for Romania and Bulgaria, so I would not, I would not uh, paint a too negative picture. Why should we do so? Um, uh, and there's media pluralism in, in Ukraine. Um, there is proven commitment to democracy. Um, they have also set an example how a society can organize itself um, and, and share things, which we might have to do at some point sooner or later as well, mm -hmm. if we have to put down the heating a little bit or there is not enough you know, gas all the time, or we need to prioritize um, those things. And but anyway, the, the pluralism, it, it's given. It's also a um, civic nation building project, um, and not a project anymore, it is a civic nation, I would argue. I mean, the paradox is that it is reinforced too much because um, Putin, who claimed that he's you know, protecting the Ruski Mir and protecting Russian speakers, well, he's shooting them all the time. I mean, the people who are most affected are Russian speakers. This is a total paradox, but Okay, so there's a civic nation building project, which by its very nature must be democratic, otherwise it doesn't work. Um, that is quite similar to, to the United States or interwar Czechoslovakia. And then, well, go for it. You know. So, but you're basically saying that the 
political uh, conditions in a country, pluralism, maybe somewhat the, the, the rule of law, separation of power, these are the key questions for being mature to join the, join the EU, less than economic development or the level no, of but, corruption. Uh, I, I think one can acknowledge that this is a key, you know, define key ingredients, do it yourself. Yes. Of course, also uh, then, uh, you know, reforms might be, uh, are of course necessary. I mean, you know it much better because you're working in the European Parliament. Um, so uh, apply some reforms, unitary voting and so on, veto powers. Um, but then if you can put that up, then, um, then it is already clear that you have a country wanting to be a member which is similar enough to the existing group. Yeah. And then you can invent procedure, you can change the procedures how to get affiliated and eventually to join. Economic things, oh well, I mean on, on economic grounds that it was always relativized in the previous rounds of enlargement. This was never a purely economic decision, mm -hmm. never ever. Yes. Otherwise, you know, Turkey would have joined and not Bulgaria. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in 2007. Mm -hmm. So, um, this is always um, a debate. Yes. Masha, I would like to ask you, uh, as a uh, know about Ukraine again, a question, and it's really relevant to this question of possible uh, uh, EU, e EU accession. Uh, there were two, before the war, there were two images of Ukraine. One was this very lively uh, democratic system where actually presidents are being voted out and they leave without resistance, they accept defeat. Um, but also one of the, the most corrupt country you can find anywhere, a place where corruption is really almost de destroying the fabric of society. Which of these two images uh, is more is more relevant in your view? Um, I'm not sure that that's. Uh, I mean, that's. Uh, first of all, I'm not. I'm not sure. I believe in that dichotomy. Okay. Uh, I think that one maybe had a bit to do with the other. Um, I think that um, one thing that I would perhaps say um, that's <clears throat> that's important in thinking through Ukraine and Ukraine as, as an anti-Russia is, um, is that Ukraine had, um, had a problem with corruption. It was not structurally entirely based on corruption yes. the way that Russia is. Okay. Um, yep. And... And, the, and, the, and, the, and that makes all, so all the difference. So Russia is the far all. more corrupt model, in your view, than than, than Ukraine. I think that was. goes that, that that almost goes without uh, without saying. Okay. But also, I mean, the um, the systems that these countries that were part of the Soviet Union in, inherited mm -hmm. were essentially mafia systems, right? Where uh, yeah. um, uh, where the, the the different parts of what constituted the Soviet state were these. Um, these mafia clans, and in one country, the the government devolved into a the, the sole mafia clan, and in other post-Soviet countries, in sort of the best case scenario, um, which is Ukraine, there were distributed mafia clans mm -hmm. that were in competition and that were also in in tension with the government. Um, that may have been the best possible place where Ukraine could have ended up by the time this war started. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is about Ukraine, and it's, uh, is that I think in, in, in 1990, uh, Ukraine's uh, per capita income was even higher than Poland's. Mm -hmm. uh, and these two countries take, took such a different development in these in, 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 in this, in, in this years. In your view, what made Poland so different, uh, to develop so differently toward not only for so many years uh, a functioning democratic system and, uh, and, and with the rule of law, but also economic development and prosperity while Ukraine fell behind more and more? Hmm. That's, that's a great question. I think we have to come to Greek mythology in order to understand that. Okay. <laughs> um, this so is a good place here on the stage of the Burg Theater. I think they, they like yes, Greek so, plays here. So, exactly. I won't cite it from, from, from my head, but, 
but uh, you all know the myth, uh, the myth about Eneas, right? Eneas emigrated and he built a new city. And this is exactly what the Poles did in 1989. We emigrated mentally from a country that was completely bankrupt. And we believed we would build a new city. Of course, within our borders, right? So this is what we did. And we have, by, whilst doing this, we have been thinking about the West as the ultimate goal, mm -hmm. not only for the economical reasons, but also for moral reasons. And now, approximately after one generation, so this is a very generation, generational thing, after one generation, so af approximately after 25 years, we basically departed, we departed to the West and we arrived. We, we, we became mm -hmm. Western. Or, as many intellectuals would like to say in my country, we returned to the West. And, well, you know this with any emigra uh, emigration. If, if you look in the, in the, in the research on, on the various generations that are experiencing emigration, that are integrating into a new country, even if this is a mental country, after a generation there, becomes, there, there, there begins a criticism. So we, we changed the, the points of reference, right? Before we were only escaping our own past. Mm -hmm. So the point of reference was the Poland of 80s, which was extremely poor and miserable. But now the point of reference is the Western Europe. Mm -hmm. So how come our we are as wealthy as the Germans yet? And this is the sentiment on which the populists mm -hmm. play, right? So you, you might say, in Poland's case, democratic and economic transformation was a very long and fast run. And during this run, we basically almost never thought about what we are losing. We only thought about what we are gaining. And we gained a lot. It was a tremendous success. But there is no success, as a great French philosopher says, uh, uh, Raymond Aron, there is no success without a cost. And there were costs. Mm -hmm. We lost a lot of our traditional identity, traditional communities, etc., etc. And having said that, I must say, you know, okay, so we think that 30 years was a long and very fast run, but look at what we are living in now. The framework of our world is not changing now from one decade to another, it is changing within a week. Mm -hmm. So every week, the framework of our world is, is, is different now, and it's not, it doesn't only concern the Poles, right? It concerns all of us. The helplessness that we feel is, is, is really the, the, co connected with the fact that we first had the pandemic, now we had to have the war. And somehow coming back to this help, because I think we should really concentrate also on good things, on how people in Europe are helping the refugees uh, from Ukraine, somehow I think this help is an aid to this helplessness. Mm -hmm. For a moment, we feel empowered. So, if Ukraine comes out of this war as a, as a, as a sovereign nation, which is not totally devastated, which can rebuild, would you ex can we expect that it may go on a similar path that Poland did uh, after 1989? Is it... Uh, you know, but uh, to think that, you, that the Ukrainians didn't embark of the same road is also okay. uh, not, not right. I think we, we basically have in our minds uh, this idea that uh, Ukrainians westernized somewhere around Euromaidan. So somewhere yeah. around 2014-15. But it's not true. The, the, the European idea, the, the westernization idea, was, was much, much earlier than, uh, there. This society has embarked of this road, on this road much earlier. Mm -hmm. It was a different road, because, also because of the Russia's influence, but it was there. And I think it's much more um, stable than, than we can realize, mm -hmm. that we are realizing. Mm -hmm. um, Claudia, you're the one person here on this panel I can ask for policy issues <laughs> you involved. What should, hap what should the EU do about uh, Ukraine, uh, EU, uh, e EU accession? 
what should be the next steps and how would you put this in relationship to also the, the, the membership aspirations on the, on the Western Balkans? Can you fast track Ukraine, even if it puts other countries like Albania and so perhaps in a position where they say, why, what, what, what about us? I don't think it necessarily should be fast track. Okay. This, this, this model doesn't exist. I think it's okay that it doesn't exist, but um, normally it's also not so easy to become a candidate, but that is the thing that can politically be fast tracked, whether or not you would okay. consider somebody an accession candidate. And that is what I believe the European Union should absolutely do, especially when you look at, or when you try to answer the question, how will Ukraine rebuild? Where will investments go? How, how, can the, how will the society react? How can, they, how can they also rebuild what they have lost in this war? Because I agree with so much that has been said, and I, I, I honestly admit that I hadn't read so much about Ukraine before the war. I knew what everybody knew. I, I had followed uh, the Euromaidan with big fascination. And um, I think even though we talked a lot about Ukraine um, after the annexation of Crimea. We were always talking about Ukraine without talking with them. Mm. Or that, at least that's what I, what I always thought that was also kind of the Angela Merkel policy. And it's such a fascinating country. It is so truly, it is, it is very much a truly modern state. It's, it's entirely different than what we had how our states in, in Europe had, or in the European Union have, ha, how we have been built, the, the history that we have. And in a way, and I, I heard this on, on a podcast that you were on about this, this conflict between this truly anti-modern Russia or the truly anti-modern Putin that simply cannot live with people that he considers to be Russians, mm -hmm. or at least doesn't allow to have their own national identity, living in democracy, in a very modern state, in a in a lively society that has, that has built itself up. Mm. And he cannot live with the fact that there might be people that he considers to be Russian that have a better life, a different life, a modern life, a democratic life. Mm. And what is more European than that? What is more European than what the Ukrainians are showing right now and how they are also showing the value of living in freedom and also the, the very clear calculation of do I want to live in freedom or do I want to live in a totalitarian regime where I might live but I might have an empty life or I might not have a life at all if I'm a part of a minority, if I'm part of the LGBTIQ community. And those are questions that Ukrainians are also answering for us in Europe because we kind of forgot because we do have a very short-term memory in Europe. We forget or many of us never knew what it would mean to live in totalitarianism. And I think it's time that we talk about that. Toward when we, the end of our discussion, which we're gradually approaching, I would like to uh, talk about, well, basically it's more than the elephant in the room, about what to do about Russia in, also in the long term. So will, and the question is for Europe, can Russia ever become part of this uh, European uh, uh, European house, as it, was, as it was talked about in the 1990s, model of security and also maybe rule of law, prosperity, uh, or will it always be the, for geographical reasons, for historical reasons, for cultural reasons, the odd man out, the, 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 perhaps the threat on the outside, or at least the, the stranger on the outside? Yeah, okay, with I, you. I, I will answer your question in a minute. But I will now take the freedom to make two more comments about Ukraine. Please. First of all, corruption. It, I mean, the everyday corruption, which also I experienced, you know, in corporations traveling, that went already down since quite a while. Um, you ask about the, uh, you know, successes of Polish reforms, and I think besides, you know, all economic spheres and so on, reforming the state, decentralization, they're doing it. Corruption went even more down now. And the self-sufficiency and you know localizing also the resistance and the war. Um, this is one of the key reasons why they could resist. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, based on on these premises, they can be very successful with further reforms and and development. 
Um, which should which should uh, qualify them to at least for candidate yes, status of in course, the EU. Yes, of course, and yes. then being so to say, um, as um, well, you know, you cannot repeat the historic past. Yes. But but being as successful as Poland, of course, in Poland, one uh, key ingredient was also very generous Western support, writing off credits, massive investment, and then the affiliation status with the European Union, the candidate status, uh, all the investment went in. So this is also why this is um, so pivotal. Now, uh, Russia, hmm. as a historian, I mean, I must say, um, it had a, a, a brief moment when it overcame its um, imperial identity. This was in the beginning of the, of the 90s. And even in the mid-90s, when the pro-Russian party won the regional elections in Crimea, Yeltsin said, no thanks, um, and did not uh, go for that. Um, and then it all changed for uh, you know so many reasons, the economic disaster in the 1990s. Um, and and then also this uh, post-imperial complex came back. You know, the imagination that it can only exist as an empire. And I think the problem is eventually the, the Russians themselves have to resolve that problem and that complex. I think there is a limited um, impact one can have um, from the outside how to how to over, overcome that. It's it's a it's a Russian thing. Mm -hmm. The the really I mean tragic aspect about all that is also if you could look at other countries, maybe even you know Serbia and all its problems to come to terms with what happened in Bosnia. Um, maybe you know this turnaround can only happen um, in a moment of defeat. Mm -hmm. And if there might be you know creating peace, how can you create peace? Um, well, of course, the Ukrainians and the Russians have to do that. So. I won't ever talk about you know Europe creating peace because after all, it's a you know Ukraine has to agree to the terms um, and how they're being made. But anyhow, um, if that peace is imagined, probably it must rely on some compromise. And what kind of compromise? We'll see. It's really difficult to imagine also because the goals of war so are so unclear, self-contradictory in the case of Russia. Mm -hmm. And and the, the problem is, you know, how to get out of this post-imperial uh, complex. I, I also wish it to the many people I know in Russia and who are very sympathetic to, to finally get out of that because it leads to nothing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just self-destruction. Yeah. Caroline, what is your take on the future of European-Russian relations. Any hope for a change, or is it something which is also based on caused by history to be bound to be extremely difficult? So we spoke today about strategy and goals yeah. and also of passions, but yes. we haven't touched on guilt yet. Okay. And yeah. I do believe that European Union wouldn't be there if it wasn't for forgiveness for the past evil and responsibility for guilt. Mm -hmm. So European uh, Union basically starts from the German guilt. Uh, and, and I do believe that it's extremely important that, that, that we focus on that because, of course, if the war is over, uh, you can have some economic relations, some political relations with Russia. But I understand that your question has bigger ambitions. You would actually like a, a tighter, a, a, a better relation. Uh, perhaps even Russia going back to, 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 to some part of its European identity. But this wouldn't be possible without the responsibility and definition of Russian guilt. Russian guilt exactly on the philosophical categories that have been, have been prepared by Karl Jaspers when he wrote about the Schuldfrage, mm -hmm. the question of the German guild. And because we, we, we don't speak only about political responsibility here and political guild, we, and, not only, and not, not, not only criminal, we also speak about, about uh, a collective uh, 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 national responsibility for what is happening. 
and I think it's, it's a very important uh, subject. We, we must think about it. We must be aware that it's probably too early to think, to, 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 to go into action, because if I talk about guilt and forgiveness, then someone of you might uh, immediately ask, how can you forgive evil that is, that is currently un ongoing, right? So, so we are talking about forgiveness here and uh, for, for the, somebody that is currently raping someone, right? So, so, so it's probably too early. I think it's, 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 a, it's a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. It's not impossible, but it, it really, it really uh, uh, it demands much more than thinking only about relations. Uh, I think excluding Russian culture, Russian history from Europe would be, would be a negative thing to do, would be a, a bad thing to do. But, but, uh, but I think it's very demanding, uh, and, and also for the Russians. Mm -hmm. Claudia, what is the, is there any chance of uh, re-establishing uh, more a relationship with Russia which goes beyond um, sanctions and, 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 and confrontation well, and this military threats from both sides? It obviously depends how they answer the question of guilt mm -hmm. in the future. And I do hope that, I, or at least I think that it's unrealistic to talk about any kind of change in the way that our relations with Russia are in the near future. Okay. This is a, I think this is a mid-term yeah. thing that we talk about. I think it very much depends on whether or not there is policy change in the European Union when it comes to unanimity vote, voting in the Council on foreign policy. Foreign if, policy. Yes, in so general. If, okay. if we end unanimity on yes. foreign policy, this question will be answered very differently than if we still have unanimity in two or three years. Because I am sure, and this might be cynical, but it's also pretty realistic, then once time passes, there will be one member state or the other who says, well, isn't it time to start reopening, trade a little bit more? And we might be one of these countries. I think that's also not unrealistic. Mm -hmm. And Hungary will probably also be in the forefront, depending on how it goes there. But we won't matter if we were to play that role, or also Hungary would, wouldn't matter if we have a majority voting on foreign policy. And I think the majority of European member states will do the right thing. I really believe that. But what has always been, been standing in the way of doing the right thing in foreign policy has been the veto possibility in the Council. And since we are looking at a very clear possibility of having a treaty convention um, starting, I don't know, maybe in half a year, and it will be voted on in the Council at the end of June, then maybe this question will be answered for the future. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, Marsha, you think you know Russia better than <laughs> anybody on this panel. Can Russia change? in a way that it makes it compatible with Europe's ideas? Well, very quickly, three things. Um, I mean, first of all, we, there, there has been an experiment in uh, Russia existing in the European space. Russia, until this year, was for more, uh, almost 30 years a member of the Council of Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, that did not work out very well. In fact, it turned out that having such a large uh, country that uh, was increasingly disregarding the the, um, the principles and 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 laws of the uh, of, of the Council of Europe, while being such a large presence and including a financial presence, was I, I think ultimately corrupting to to the Council of Europe, um, and uh, and had uh, less and less influence on Russia itself as as the years went on. Um, Two, it's very strange to me that we're, you know, this, there's like this, this cognitive, um, uh, uh, co cognitive split that happens that, you know, we have talked about how our entire world has changed because of the war, and now we're discussing a Russia and a Ukraine and, uh, and a post-war as though they were in any way predictable um, and even conceivable, and, um, and they're not. Mm -hmm. Uh, and specifically, I think that a negotiated peace is very unlikely. But if it happens, then uh, then we're looking at you know, Russia as a country that has 
occupied part of a neighboring country, um, and that if there's a negotiated peace, uh, Putin, having suffered some sort of defeat, will turn the terror on inside the country to an extent that we have not yet seen. So that's not a country that can uh, that will want to or can possibly have uh, even you know a constructive relationship with Europe, much less uh, membership in the European Union. And if it's a defeat at Russia, if it's actually if the war actually ends with Russia's defeat, I don't see the Russian Federation surviving in its current form. The um, over the years of the Putin regime, the pressure on members of the Russian Federation, which is a, a sort of rump empire, uh, has has increased to such an extent that there are separatist movements in places where there were never separatist movements. And if, if Russia is defeated, the first thing that will happen is that it will split apart. And maybe that's the best, the best chance that its constituent parts have of forging a post-imperial imagination, a post-imperial identity, um, and of um, reckoning with things that I think, while they're thought of as, you know, I, I, I think that what, what has allowed Ukraine and other post-Soviet states to move forward is telling a story that others, the horrors of the 20th century, uh, that's a luxury that Russia hasn't had, and perhaps a, a post-Russian post countries uh, that can also other that that guilt to some extent can tell a different story. Well, we've come to the end of our time. Uh, Ninety minutes have passed. Um, it's difficult to be even slightly optimistic, but at least there are some pros prospects that that of of, of of a future which will be better than 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 the, than the present. I would like to thank you all of you very much for this very interesting discussion and your, your, your insights, and I want to thank you too for your attention and your interest for being here, and I want to wish you all a very nice Sunday and also a happy Mother's Day. Thank you. <laughs>